Hey, welcome to Exchange. Let's talk about Teladoc. Kathy Wood's still buying. What's going on with the impairment charge and where it might go in the future? So this is the graph of Teladoc. And as you see, obviously, like like most uh, you know COVID stocks, I mean, it's really trying to redefine the way you see your doctor with the whole telehealth visits and everything else too. It really made sense during the COVID pandemic. I mean, but really... The growth rates change from like near vertical now to really the, a flatter you know overall time horizon for the 2020s. But you see obviously the peak right there, kind of the mean week we had back in the you know January February of 2021. Um, but really, I mean it's been on a straight downtrend. Obviously the last you know month or so has been absolutely horrible for Teladoc. They had a massive goodwill impairment right down. Which we'll, we'll get to that later a little bit. But notice at 2018 so 2017 levels about 30 you know 33 34 dollars is trading there right now. Almost they gave up the entire kind of COVID you know, kind of quantitative easing gains. Um, Kathy was still buying though. Let's take a look at that. So this is from last Friday. This is basically her market commentary for end of the week commentary. She mentioned Teladoc. Um, so basically what was saying is, hey, Thursday after the curly orange report, it fell 40%. But she's noticing, hey, compared to 2017 levels, um, the, vol the vol visit volumes are 5x higher. It's paid member count is twice as high. Annual revenue is 5x higher. It's cash flow positive. The 106 Americans is a full Teladoc member, which is roughly 50 million American, which is a massive number. Um, the primary reason Teladoc, uh, she, she believes, sudden stock decline appears to be a 25% reduction in 2022 uh, adjusted EBITDA guidance, which EBITDA is uh, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, and adjusted means, basically means they made adjustments off that number, usually for the positive side, to bring it up a little bit. Um, it's basically what the big fear I mean, the Wall Street really has is the high CAC, so basically customer acquisition costs are coming up pretty high, um, so that's kind of the big fear. Basically, what you're saying here is, hey, Teladoc has increased adjusted EBITDA by more than 650% and doubled its, basically its uh, adjusted EBITDA margin boosting, and also boosting its cash position at more than $900 million, which, which cash-wise, it is fine. I do agree with her on that point right there. Let's we'll dive into some of the numbers and see what's going on behind the scenes in Teladoc. So this is their last quarter, quarterly reports, uh, basically presentation. Um, and really jumping on the slide for us, the kind of the big number you see right here. You see adjusted EBITDA coming down from 56.6%. Uh, down to 54.5 so negative four percent um year over year which again it's not terrible but it is, it's it's kind of bad overall revenue growth is you know 25 percent, which again it's not hyper growth it's more that medium growth which i mean it's getting pretty big so this is not too bad overall uh i mean again access fee revenue is growing 29 percent, which is not too bad there visit fee revenue is growing 12 percent. so again they're still having positive revenue growth they're still growing as a company it's just not the hyper growth you saw during covid potentially where it was like hey things are going to the moon potentially and knows the future of all medicine was going to be Teladoc. So this slide's more of the bad news. Kind of what you're seeing really here is paid U.S. members. It's it's not growing that fast. Um, it is still growing, but it, it's just it's marginal gains quarter over quarter. Um, also look at chronic members right here. I mean, it hit the seven hundred um, thousand right there, and it's just really been kind of flat overall. Um, again, we are it is still rising in the first quarter twenty twenty two, but I mean it, it's marginal gains um, across the board right there. And then uh, basically the ARPU average revenue per user. Again, it, it's 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 looking like it might be topping out potentially. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this summer next quarter if this actually drops down below its current level potentially. But again, we'll see what happens with that. Um, Actually, I'm going to you this slide right here. So this is really the big slide on the right right here, just the EBITDA, just the EBITDA margin. And this massive drop is really what scared the market overall too. Going from, going from $770 million on a 54.5 on just the EBITDA basis, looking at the actual margin dropping too. I mean, this is basically just overall bad on bad right here. And that's really why the stock, I think, dropped so much on top of the goodwill impairment charge too. So let's have their income statement real fast. Um, this is from their last 10K, and this is uh, so actually top line revenue of a little over $2 billion last year. Um, not too bad. I mean, and cost of revenue is uh, $650 million. So you're seeing there, I mean, it's a pretty healthy gross profit margin overall. I mean, so this, this company is profitable on a gross profit basis. Look at the actual OPEX expenses here. I mean, advertising marketing, $400 million. That's like roughly 20% of revenues. I mean, that is a very, very high number. That's really what Wall Street fears. Is the customer acquisition cost going, you know, much, much higher? So looking from 2020, revenue basically doubled from 2021. And look at the actual, uh, basically the advertising marketing expenses, customer, basically the CAC almost doubled with it as well too, which that's not usually a good sign. You usually want to see economies of scale, basically as revenue goes up, the, the basically the marketing spend per user should be dropping overall, which we're not quite seeing that with Teladoc, which is really the big fear you have. Um, looking at sales overall, it's not quite as bad. 2020, $150 million, 2021, um, $250 million, so basically a quarter billion dollars. It's getting not too bad there. Tech and development, we don't know quite what this is exactly, but obviously they're you know, basically an internet platform, so I mean, they have to spend heavily for that overall. Um, acquisition and integration transformation costs, they actually made two major roll-ups in 2020, um, basically, which this is why I see the bigger number here in 2020 versus 2021, which this should be still, uh, still a continuing expense as they integrate and as they synergize with these uh, acquisition targets or acquisition companies. Um, again, 
Uh, GNA, actually, this is really interesting too. They actually, I think they know they have an OPEX problem. So you actually see it dropped in 2021, which is surprising because it may be sort of behind the scenes. They know, hey, they have a big issue here. And they're trying to drop their expenses down or to maintain their actual, basically EBITDA, like not be as, as you know, grossly negative across the board. Um, DNA, obviously, it's, I mean, as they grow, you're going to have more DNA expenses across the board. Um, Overall loss from operations, it was actually less in 2020. But again, you get the big fear now. This is peak COVID overall, too, in 2020, 2021, too. The big fear is, hey, in 2022 or 2023, is this number go massively more negative potentially as basically, you know, you have the headwinds with interest rate rising as well as potentially post-code environment. Teladoc's not as necessary for most uh, consumers. But that's really the big fear they have overall. Um, and the, I mean, looking at EBITDA basis, it is it is a lot better than it was in 2021 or 2020. Uh, going from four hundred thirty six million dollars negative to negative sixty one million dollars, just the EBITDA basis, they're massively more profitable. But again, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. So this is their balance sheet I pulled up right here. So the first thing you notice here is look at their total assets seventeen billion dollars. But then look at their goodwill; it's fourteen point five billion dollars. Um, you know, look at twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. Which again, goodwill is not it's not good or bad. Um, if you don't know what goodwill is, all goodwill is basically is when you acquire companies, you have a book value, basically a set value for that company. Anything you pay over that, basically the premium you pay is basically recorded as goodwill, which is fine if the acquisition target grows and you basically have accretive revenues over time that actually add to your overall earnings per share, et cetera. The problem is though, when it goes badly, which like in Teladoc's case, it's going pretty poorly right now, you could have goodwill write downs where all of a sudden that, that book value of basically that acquired target all of a sudden drops dramatically and you basically have to impair your goodwill, basically write down your goodwill, which again, for most companies is fine because they have a small goodwill as a percent of total assets and Teladoc's case is the opposite. So you have a massive amount of goodwill. So I mean, it's roughly like, what is this, 80% or so? It's basically other total assets is goodwill. They're a very asset-like company, which again, is good for them to grow because it doesn't take much to grow with them. The problem is though, if this goodwill number drops, it's gonna be hurting their overall like, economics overall. So it really like gets down to the, really the accounting equation. What the accounting equation is, is all it's saying is total assets equals total liabilities plus, plus stockholders equity. So this total asset number should always, always, always equal total liabilities and stockholders equity. Um, which is fine, uh, basically, if, if Goodwill is growing, or if you have the Goodwill, basically, the acquisition target's growing, the revenues overall through time. The problem is, though, is when Goodwill writes down, your debt does not change. You still owe X number of dollars you owe across the board. There's no change there. So what happens is, hit your equity. So basically, as Goodwill assets drop, and you pair those assets, the equity will drop with it, too, which overall hurts the future growth of the company, potentially, or future equity growth of the company overall. Um, that's kind of the big fear you, you, we have right now. So they actually impaired goodwill by $6 billion, which is, um, I mean, this is a, a ma massive, massive write down. Um, the big fear is, hey, there's going to be future impairment charges coming, which will keep dropping the goodwill charges down, which will drop the assets down, which will then drop the equity down with it as well, too. That's kind of the big fear you have for both summer and fall of 2022. So let's take a look at what they actually acquired. So this was their first target they had. This was in touch, which they acquired in January 2020, right before COVID hit. It wasn't a big acquisition overall. Um, I believe it was 600 million, yeah, 600 million dollars. Um, basically, a mixture of cash and stock. The really the big one though was uh, Livongo. So Livongo was acquired in fall of 2020 uh, for uh, what 18.5 billion dollars. The actual book value here was about you know, three or four billion dollars, which was a majority of that goodwill right there. So basically, the asset. It's worth three or four billion dollars. They paid four x that eighteen billion dollars. So you have fourteen million dollars or so of goodwill basically on your balance, your uh, balance sheet as an asset right there. So what's happening right now is Lavongo when they acquired them about a hundred, I think one hundred twenty million dollars of revenue. I think now they might be two three hundred million dollars. They're not a big company overall. And the, the thing is, what's happening in the past two years is Lavongo's basically you know projected growth rates, revenue growth rates, margin growth rates. They probably all missed their targets. So they're probably well in performing where they should be based on the acquisition plan when they first acquired them. So what's happening right now behind the scenes, they're actually having to write down those assets, basically, potentially. Um, and now Lavongo, I mean, it could still be a great acquisition target. It could take hey, maybe long term, you know, that 10 year time horizon could still ramp up and grow in those kind of those projections overall. But at least in the right now, in the short term, especially with quantitative tightening happening right now, it's going to be very, very rough to actually meet some of those targets. So this is from their 10K as well, too. It's really how they actually impair assets, which, which they do quarterly. I mean, you have to with a goodwill imbalance. You have to basically, basically, they call it goodwill testing or goodwill impairment testing. Um, so basically, what all that really means is they basically take this um, using a mixture of income, basically the price to sales ratio, as well as the market interest rates and everything else, too. So what it's saying here is October 1st, 2021, they had an implied discount rate of 9.5%, which basically is the riskiness of the company itself. So if I had to guess, it's probably about, you know, the actual 10 year bond rate plus eight, eight and a half percent or so. Um, is the actual uh, discount rate they use for basically their acquisition targets. They also use a peer group revenue multiple, which all this means is price to sales ratio, 
which you can see in 2021, it has gone up. 2022 has gone down for both uh, the October test and the December test. And basically what this is, what this means is, hey, they're reporting fair value over the carrying value. So basically, as long as this number is positive, a positive percentage, it means you're good to go. The problem is in this spring, what happened was this number went negative by it looks like 30 or 40%, which is why they did the 40% right there impairment charge in April of $6 billion on a goodwill. So we'll, we'll see updated uh, numbers later on once they, once they publish their 10Q. Um, but again, this is as interest rates rise, the 10 year bond rises, it'll hurt the actual goodwill uh, and testing overall even longer. And as revenue multiples drop, it should hurt it even more too, which I mean, these are very high revenue multiples. If I had to guess, Lavongo and InTouch probably should have about a two or three price of sales uh, overall ratio. Just because, I mean, because they are high profit though. The problem is you have a lot of headwinds to growth and it's going to be a very challenging environment in 2022 and probably 2023. So, I mean, the big fear you have though is it just cuts in half. All of a sudden, the goodwill basically is wiped out at that point and your assets on your balance sheet are wiped out as well, or most of the assets are wiped out as well too. And all of a sudden, the equity just massively drops with it. So, I did also want to touch on this really fast too. So, this is basically their. Um, reconciliation between adjusted EBITDA and EBITDA and also their net loss. So what happens is you have a, you have a cash net loss of $428 million in 2021. Um, basically, you get to, to get the actual EBITDA number, basically, which, which would usually add your extinguishment of debt. So basically, pre, or basically paying down your debt, you um, take away your basically other expenses. It looks like income here, interest expense net, you basically add that back as well. Income tax expense, you add that back. Depreciation amortization, again, massive, massive number. You add that back as well. And from that number, you get the actual EBITDA of another 61 million. Now, the problem here, though, is too, is like, hey, paying down debt is part of business. Depreciation amortization is basically allocating, uh, basically allocating your future capex, future spending you're going to have in later years, to basically grow your business. Because, I mean, any, any company, if you don't keep reinvesting the company, eventually it's going to die. You're going to have bad computers. You're going to have bad you know physical infrastructure. You're going to have bad overall issues. So you have to keep reinvesting at CapEx in order to actually keep your business alive for the long term. That's why it's dangerous, but basically to like EBITDA away, basically depreciation amortization. Because even though it sounds like it's like a non-cash expense, it's not real. Long term, it's going to be real. Basically, it represents a future cash outflow um, as you reinvest in your business overall. Now, taking EBITDA, get to just EBITDA. You add back stock-based compensation, acquisition, and integration, transformation costs right there. Which again, it sounds like, hey, these are non-cash events. I mean, the actual the actual acquisition and integration uh, transformation costs are really hopefully one-time hits or two-time hits overall here. These aren't massive numbers right here, but again, I mean, it takes time and money to actually onboard. You know, whether it's in touch or Lavongo, get them actually into processes. You know, make sure everything's going well overall, and you have those synergies. Um, because I mean, that's that's one thing. It's very it's just part of business basically. And you can't just like wipe it away by calling it hey a non-cash event potentially or making an adjusted EBITDA uh, number. Now, stock-based compensation. Is it's a really weird one here. So it's $300 million in 2021. This is a massive number. And the problem with this one too, is if, hey, let's say you just didn't pay stock-based competition at all, which what that would become now is a cash-based expense, basically. Because otherwise your employees would just leave. They wouldn't work there anymore. Because if you're, not, if, like, if you're not paying your employees a fair wage, then all of a sudden it's just like, you're not going to have a business much longer. And that's really what stock-based compensation is representing here. Even though it's like a non-cash expense to the company itself, it's still going to be a compensation cash expense at a later time and date when they either give them stock or they invest the stock or they or they basically that loops the shareholders overall. Um, that's really the big thing you have right there. So I mean, EBITDA, just the EBITDA in this case, I would say it's a little bit inflated quite a bit. So you got to be careful with that too. Really looking at the actual net income basis is the best way to look at it right now. Which and that in that basis, I mean, it's still a very very negative company. But which considering the headwind or the tailwinds you've had during COVID with the whole telehealth kind of revolution, etc. I mean, this is a very dangerous spot to be in. But just going on qualitative tightening. I mean, right now, I don't know if I'd buy the stock right now, but let's dive into that real fast. So at the end of the day, like what do I think the company's actually worth? So I mean, looking at actual enterprise value to sales, it's actually probably a little underpriced potentially. Um, I mean, again, if I was if I bought you know sub fifty dollars, I might hold here north of fifty. I mean, there's so many headwinds coming with quantitative tightening, et cetera, where I'm like, hey, I mean, you just may want to cash out because it's like looking at this, the actual reward versus the risk you're going to be facing. I think the risk is much much higher now than the actual reward. Because really, what's going to happen right now is you have this massive goodwill bomb on your balance sheet, and if it actually implodes, I mean, this stock can go like south of ten dollars. I mean, it could be a, a massive, massive like one time hit. Really, I mean, it'll be, it'll be a one time hit. It'll be bad. But the problem is to getting back to those like, you know, hundred dollar, you know, plus levels. I mean, it's going to take time if they ever get there at all, potentially too. So again, south of 50, I'd probably hold north of 50. If I was, if I acquired north of 50 average price, I'd probably end up dumping this for something else because I think a lot more opportunities out there beyond Teladoc, which I, I think add more value potentially to your portfolio. Hey, but that's Teladoc. I mean, Kathy Wood is still buying. She's still a believer in the kind of long-term value prop. Me personally, I'm a little bit nervous about the kind of like goodwill place bob on the balance sheet. But again, I could be totally wrong or she could be totally wrong too. Uh, obviously, be sure to sub, like, comment down below, and um, yeah, that's the exchange.